that we are in the blessed month of Rajab, one of the sacred months, and in these closing days and nights, that tonight is the 27th night of Rajab, which is, according to many of the ulama, the date of the blessed Isra wa Mi'raj, the blessed night journey of the Prophet from Mecca to Jerusalem, Al Quds, and then from there, the Mi'raj, the ascension up into the heavens and past the seven heavens, the seven skies of the cosmos, Samawat, Asaba, and then beyond Asidr al Muntaha, the furthest low tree, and uh, witnessing the signs of his Lord, Azza wa Jal, Sallallahu Ta'ala wa Sallam. And according to the dominant position of Sunni orthodoxy, <coughs> having, uh, experiencing not only the speech, direct speech, intimate discourse with Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala, but in fact having ru'ya, the vision of Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala, which in this dunya was granted only to our Blessed Prophet وسلم, as a manifestation and sign of his blessed rank, peace and blessings be upon him, as the best of creation, وسلم, but uh, reserved for all, of, all believers in the hereafter in paradise. And we ask Allah SWT to make all of us and our families and loved ones and friends and companions uh, amongst them. Ameen. And so reflecting just for uh, a few, the few minutes that we have together, reflecting on some of the lessons of the Isra wa Mi'raj that perhaps we can uh, directly apply in our lives and not simply to recollect the sacred story and to reflect on the wonders that were bestowed to our Blessed Prophet وسلم, which itself is a great thing, which itself is a remembrance of Allah Himself, and which is something that we are rewarded for, and which is a basis of drawing nearer to Allah, but also deriving some practical things that we can apply directly in our lives thereafter, after hearing the, and being reminded of the sacred story, in light of which I encourage everyone to attend the event tonight in the masjid and, and bringing you know, your families to uh, be reminded of this sacred and beautiful story, but also that thereafter that we have specific particular things that we can work on in terms of our relationship with Allah SWT and that it's a uh, one of the one of the secrets of the first verse of Surah Al-Isra which references this night journey, Subhanallah Asra bi Abdihi Laylan in Al Masjid al Haram in Al Masjid al Aqsa, is that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, you know, the translation of the verse, uh, transcendent and glorious above the imagination, is the one who took his servant by night uh, on a, on a special night, Laylan, from the sacred precinct in Mecca to the furthest mosque i.e. in Jerusalem, is that the attribute by which Allah Ta'ala describes the Prophet is that Subhanallah asra bi abdihi and according to many of the Mufassireen, this is ashraf, ashraful maqam this is the ashraful maqamat, this is the most honorific title granted to the Prophet Sallallahu in the Qur'an and in the context of the greatest of blessings that Allah Ta'ala bestowed upon the Prophet وسلم, the most wondrous of blessings, the description is Abdullah or Abdihi, the servant of Allah or his servant. The, this is the most honorific title of the Prophet وسلم, in the Quran. And the next surah, Surah Al-Kahf, Alhamdulillah, that he anzala ala Abdihi al-Kitab. This is also a supreme blessing granted to the Prophet وسلم, is the sending down of the book. And what's the description of the Prophet in the context of the sending down of the book, وسلم, is Abdihi, again, his servant. And this nisbah, this ascription to Allah, this ibaq of construction in the Arabic language, the servant of him, his servant, this is profound. That Allah Ta'ala has ownership, he takes ownership of the Prophet وسلم, that it he is his servant, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But also the Prophet is, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the servant of Allah. And this is a trait that we can all partake in. In other words, when the Prophet is described as Nabi or Rasul, this is something that, this is designated to special individuals. 
And the Prophet is the last of Prophets and Messengers, peace be upon them all. But Urbudiyah is a door that's open for all of us and incumbent on, upon all of us to enter into. And so, realizing our servitude, an Urbudiyah, that not, mere, not merely Ibadah, which is the physical worship of Islam, Ibadah, the worship of the prayer and the worship of giving zakat and the worship of the fasting, etc., but Urbudiyah, the state of the heart, the state of servitude that is in the heart, in those acts of devotions, and therefore outside as well, throughout our days and nights. Actualizing our obudiya, actualizing our servitude towards the divine. And of the most salient qualities of servitude, or the servants of Allah, is tawbah, is repentance. And this is one practical thing that we can take, is that the reminder of Isra al Miraj is a divine summons to each of us to renew our tawbah to Allah to deepen and intensify our repentance to Allah, to make it more real in our lives, to make it something more actualized in the way that we are, in the, in, in the way that we are in the morning, the way that we are in the evening, the way that we are throughout our times, is in a state of repentance. Penitence is a great virtue, and it's the, of, it's of the most salient virtues of true servitude. The true servant of Allah is never satisfied with the way that they are. And interestingly enough, one of the specific recommendations from the Sunnah for the month of Rajab is istighfar. Istighfar is one of the most specific, it's one of the most important specific devotions of the sacred month. And so this is as a reflection of our servitude to Allah, is asking for forgiveness and ever being ever penitent and turning unto Him in tawbah, in repentance. And this presupposes an ethic of introspection, that each of us is conscious of the way that we are, and that we notice our slips, and we notice our faults, and which of us doesn't have our slips, and which of us doesn't have our faults. And this is something that we are, uh, this, is the, this, is the, this is something that none of us can deny. The ayub, let alone the vunub, the faults of, 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 that we have, let alone the, the sins that we slip into. And so it's the thought. The Prophet Sallallahu made istighfar 70 to 100 times a day, despite the fact that he was sinless and infallible, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What about us then? Tawbah to Allah Azza wa Jal. And this is something Allah Ta'ala is overjoyed with. This is the basis of receiving the divine joy. Allahu afrahu bi tawbati abdihi min ahadikum sakata ala ba'ayrihi wa qad abaduhu bi abdil farat. As in the authentic hadith in Bukhari and Muslim, is that Allah Ta'ala is more overjoyed with the repentance of His servant, of His servant, Tawbah to Abdihi. This is what informs Urbudiyah. Then someone in the desert who had lost his camel with all of his, all, all of his provisions on that camel and then suddenly finds it, stumbles upon, Sakata ala ba'idi, stumbles upon that lost camel. The joy in the heart of a man facing his his, his, his very, the loss of survival in a desert without any provision and finding the camel with all of that water and food, Allah Ta'ala is more overjoyed with, this, with the repentance of the servant. SubhanAllah. And so inviting that joy into our lives. And this is something that we have to be, we, this is something that we have to have a sense of urgency for. It's not just putting this off. Imam Nabi mentions in the Riyadh al-Salihin that it is, it's a religious obligation to make tawbah for every time we sin. It's wajib shara'an in, in, in the sacred law of Islam for every instance of committing a sin to seek forgiveness for that and make repentance for that. And that presupposes not only recognizing one's wrongs but having remorse for them and being committed to not doing it again. This is the istighfar of the mu'min. It's not simply lip service, but it's heart service, heart servitude. It's not lip service, it's heart servitude. Heart servitude. And this is why one of the early metaphysicians of Islam, Sahih ibn Abdullah Tusari, the great Persian metaphysician of the 3rd century, he says, At-tawbatu tarkul tasweet. Repentance is to not procrastinate. Repentance is to not procrastinate. A sense of urgency, a sense of duty. It's not that we never sin. We are fallible. Kullu ibn Adam khata' wa khayrul khata'in at-tawabun. The hadith mentions every human being, other than Prophet is 
going to sin, is prone to error, is prone to sin. But, but the best of them are the ones that repent and apologize and have remorse and try their best not to do it again. This is what is incumbent upon each of us. This is the month of istighfar and this is the month of ubudiya and this is the description of the Prophet specifically in Isra wa Mi'raj. Our ubudiya presupposes our ethic of Tawbah, our the consistency of Tawbah, the urgency of Tawbah. And through this Tawbah, through consistent, genuine Tawbah, the sins will lessen, inshaAllah. As one of the, another metaphysician of Persia, Azerbaijan, Bundar ibn Hussein. Bundar ibn Hussein was a Shafi'i, jurist, and Usubi scholar, and he was a student of Abu Bakr al-Shirbi. He says, Man harabat min al-dunub, harabat minhu. Man harabat min al-dunub, harabat minhu. Whoever flees from sins, through tawbah, through repentance, through remorse, through genuinely being committed to not repeat them, harabat minhu, those sins flee from him. The devil is less interested in causing them to stumble because they are empowered through their toba, through their genuine attitude of servitude towards the divine. And this is also the basis of protection from Allah. Istighfar is the great shield of the believer in this life, let alone for the hereafter. What a great shield in the hereafter. Istighfar is the best shield in the hereafter. Sins will... We, we will stumble and fall as fallible humans on earth. But our safety net is asking for forgiveness. And so in the, in the next life, when the fire, when, when, we, when we're held accountable, and it's either the par- paradise or fire, we ask Allah Ta'ala to let us not enter fire at all, that istighfar will be the profound shield from the fire. But also in this life, it's a protection from calamities. Or when calamities strike one's vicinity from it being for a, a special grace for a person. Calamities are interwoven in the fabric of this life. That's something that is very clear from the Kitab and Sunnah. Muslims don't have the problem that in philosophy is called the problem of suffering. The problem of suffering is not a problem for Muslims. It never was in our theological discourse. It wasn't a salient issue. It was dealt with secondarily, ter- as a tertiary matter. Why? Because from the very basic reading of, the, of, of our scripture, every believer recognizes that suffering is interwoven in the fabric of this life. This is not the abode, uh, this is not paradise. This is not the abode of paradisical life. This is the abode of a life that has its ups and downs, hills and valleys. The paradise is in the next life. That's evident to every believer. But those calamities, Allah Ta'ala gives a special grace for the people of istighfar, for the people of genuine, consistent repentance and seeking forgiveness, that even at times of calamities, they have a safeguard. And this is why another of our early metaphysicians, Abu, Abu Hassan al-Shadri, rahimahullah ta'ala, that he says, أَحْسَنُ الْحُسُونَ مَا أَخْبَرَكَ بِهِ مِنَ الْإِسْتِغْفَارِ The best fortress basis of protection. The best fortress is what he, capital H, has informed you of seeking forgiveness. Of seeking forgiveness. And the reality of istighfar is that your only source of solace and comfort is Allah. The only one with whom you feel truly comfortable with truly at solace and peace with is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and none besides. And then he cites the verse, Rahimullah, that Allah Ta'ala وقال Allah Ta'ala وَمَا كَانَ وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُعَذِّبَهُمْ مَهُمْ يَسْتَغْفِرُونَ وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُعَذِّبَهُمْ مَهُمْ يَسْتَغْفِرُونَ like his proof for it's the base, it's the best protection, and Allah was not going to punish them while they are seeking forgiveness. This is the best fortress, and this is one of the blessings of Rajab to tajdi the tawbah, to renew our commitment to repentance and istighfar as an expression of our ubudiyah, the very quality described of attributed to the Prophet with respect to the Islam of Miraj.
Alhamdulillah, and reflecting on this last wisdom that we just cited from Abu Hassan al-Shadri, rahimahullah, that not only is istighfar the best fortress of the believer, but notice what he says about its reality. وَحَقِيقَتُهُ أَنْ لَا يَكُونَ لَكَ مِنْ لَيْهِ قَرَارٍ and the reality of seeking forgiveness is that you have no true solace and source of comfort and refuge besides Allah. And this is also one of the secrets of the Isra wa Mi'raj, is that the true solace of our Prophet was Allah. The Isra wa Mi'raj happened, according to most scholars of Sira, right after Am al Huzn. And notice Am al Huzn, what was the, the year of sadness? The year of sadness was a year, the most difficult year for our Prophet And it was the year in which he lost, peace and blessings be upon him, all of the worldly sources of comfort and solace, even though the whole time his true comfort was with Allah. But in terms of asbab in the world, worldly needs, Khadija, his beloved, blessed wife, Allah be pleased with her, what was how much, how valuable was she to the Prophet ﷺ? How much love was between them? How much comfort did she provide for him? ﷺ, specifically in the context of the difficulties of inviting to Islam in the most uh, uh, difficult, aggressive environment towards uh, the religion, towards the faith, towards the freedom of religion, effectively, essentially. The issue was not simply this religion, but there was no freedom of religion. He wasn't even allowed to proclaim what he, what was being revealed to him, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But in any case, look at the the the, uh, the blessings that unfolded from Lady Khadija, our blessed mother, Allahumma. So financial support and emotional support through the vicissitudes of summoning people to Allah in the difficult early years of the Meccan period, and then the loss of Abu Talib. This is not only. The, the, the last fatherly figure in his blessed life, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as we know, orphan at, at a young age, and then Abdul Muttalib, another fatherly figure in his early years, he loses him at a very young age, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and then Abu Talib was the fatherly figure. And in the Arabic language, the, 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 the brother of the father is like the father. This is why when in the story of Bahira, the monk, <coughs> That he says, is this, is, who's this person's father? Abu Talib says, I'm his father. And Bahira says, that's impossible because the, according to the scripture, he was orphaned. And so he admits, he's like, it's true, actually, I'm his father's brother. His father's passed away. And the Bahira says, that's true because the scripture said that. But why did he say the first time it wasn't a lie? Because in the Urf of the Arab, in the, in the custom of the Arabs, the brother of the father is, is, is an effective father. It's like the father. And especially if the baby was orphaned from the father. This is why also in our Aqidah, the, the Azar in the Qur'an was not the actual father of Sayyidina Ibrahim a.s. And this is mentioned by Ibn Kathir, the name of the father of Ibrahim a.s. was Tariq. But Azar was the paternal uncle, the brother of Tariq. And this is, what, this is why Ibrahim a.s. when he invites him to Islam, he says, Ya Abati, oh my father. But the point being is that losing Abu Talib is effectively, essentially losing another father. And then also the political support that Abu Talib had provided the entire time. Because then it became nominal, Abu Dahab took on the, the, the head of, uh, uh, of, the, of the clan of uh, Banu Hashim, Banu Muttalib, and then its support, in quotes, and giving a license to the aggressors to do what they would. This is when the, the, the punishment, the, the difficulties really intensified for the Prophet in Makkah. For him, his, his blessed person specifically, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So losing Abu Talib, the loss of worldly political support, as well as that fatherly figure. And then the da'wah at Ta'if, as you all know from the blessed Sirah, and the rejection from the people of Ta'if 
at the hands of the people that the Prophet generally loved the most, children and servants, the disenfranchised of a community and the children of a community, or the ones from whose hands the stones were being thrown upon his blessed person, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, such that he was bleeding, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And every worldly sabab was removed, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Every sabab that in the world was a locus of comfort and solace, which is really from Allah, and the whole time the Prophet was recognizing Allah and all the solace he received his entire life, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But all of that is taken away, and he turns to Allah as he always turns to Allah, which is what tawbah means, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, returning to Allah in the beautiful dua after ta'if, expressing his faqr and ubudiyah, expressing his neediness for the divine and his servitude towards the divine despite those difficulties, and then what shortly thereafter ensues, according to the scholars of the Sira, al-Islam al Mi'raj, meeting Allah directly. Meeting Allah directly. Let alone the wonders that were unfolding of the cosmos and the heaven and heaven and, 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 and paradise and hellfire and all the angelic realms and all the secrets of the cosmos being unfolded. Yet he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, did not even divert his glance. His glance was not diverted, nor did it trespass. He was focused only on one on that night, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The only one he loved, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, truly. His qaran, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His solace, his comfort, his refuge, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The, he is the Habibullah. Allah Ta'ala is al-wadud. And the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is the most profound and direct recipient of that wood and mahabba from the, from the Divine Himself. And this is the meaning of beloved. SubhanAllah. SubhanAllah. What a night. What a night. And that's also part of the answer to this quote, problem of suffering. Is that Allah will give spiritual illumination to the, sound, to the servant who during their suffering and during their trials, they, they stay connected to their Lord. And they go back to their Lord in a state of utter need and, and, and servitude. They hold on to their arida billah, can content with whatever Allah is sending them, the blows of faith, even though it's painful. Pain is natural to experience, but not complaining to the divine, not objecting to the divine. Then there's spiritual openings, unimaginable spiritual openings. But the Prophet ﷺ had only one, one goal that night. SubhanAllah, his Lord, Allah Himself. Jibreel could not cross. This is the low tree. This is for the Prophet. ﷺ. This is his maqam. Maqam al Mahmud. He is Muhammad. ﷺ. He is Ahmed. ﷺ. <coughs> ﷺ. And so, what was granted to him? as an expression of that love for the rest of his life and for the life, all of our lives as believers, the Salat, the ritual prayer. This is, our, this is our meeting with the beloved. This is our meeting with our beloved, our true solace and comfort, Allah, Azzawajal. And this is where we need to place that love, place our hearts into the prayer. As a reflection of that beautiful meeting, because each of us in our own context, in our own states as servants of Allah, we need Allah. And we can meet Allah in our own way in the Salat. And so this is the, 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 the most important lesson from the Isra al Miraj is give our hearts to the prayer. Give our hearts to the prayer. Because this is our meeting with Allah as a reflection, as mirroring something, some drops of the ocean of that meeting on that night. We ask Allah Ta'ala to make us people of genuine repentance, people of genuine servitude, people of genuine mahabba with the divine Allah Ta'ala, with the Prophet Sallallahu with the blessed companions of Allah, we them all, with the believers and the righteous and the awliya of Islam and the iman. We ask Allah Ta'ala to, to rectify our hearts and to make us people who taste the sweetness of Rajab and to taste the sweetness of Sha'ban and taste the sweetness of Ramadan. We ask Allah Ta'ala to make us people who are oriented towards Allah, that just as the qibla of our prayer is towards Makkah and Muharramah, that the qibla of our hearts is only Allah, in the prayer and outside the prayer. That the qibla of our hearts is always directed towards Allah and His good pleasure, 
and everything that he loves, Azzawajal, and his remembrance and presence, Azzawajal. We ask Allah Ta'ala to give us afia and amin and for ourselves and our and our families and the entire ummah, Allah Mufarraj Amna wa Ahlul Muslimin, fi kulli nafan, Rabbina Atina bin Abdul Rahman, wa Hiyya bin Abdul Amri wa Rashada, Inna Allah wa Malaikatahu yusalluna ala Nabi, Ya Ayyuhal Ladina Amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu al-Nasima, Allahumma salli wa sallimu barik ala Sayyidina Muhammad al-Nabi Rumi, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim tasliman kathira, wa alhamdulillahi wa barakatuhu 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 w